US President Joe Biden has promised Israel ironclad support amid fears that Iran could retaliate over a strike on its embassy in Damascus last week. Iran's supreme leader says the attack, which killed several senior Iranian commanders, was equivalent to an attack on Iranian territory and that Israel must be, and I quote, punished. Israel has not claimed responsibility but is widely considered to have been behind the strike. It's being reported that intelligence services in the United States and other allied officials believe a significant attack by Iran is imminent and could come in the form of direct missile or through a proxy like Hezbollah in Lebanon. Joining me now to discuss this, former British ambassador to Iran, Sir Richard Dalton, and Scott Lucas, professor of international politics at University College Dublin's Clinton Institute. Uh, let me start uh, with, with Richard Lucas about this one. Um, this is a, an exceedingly delicate situation, obviously, and Joe Biden, you might say, is making a kind of preemptive strike in declaring his hand so strongly at this point. What do you imagine is going on? Sir Richard. Oh, I thought it were you were addressing Scott. No, I'm not. Uh, uh, what I think is going on is that the inevitability of a retaliatory strike by Iran is now being anticipated for the next few days. That may or may not be true. The Iranians will require time to plan what they want to do. They have said that it'll happen, but not given any time scale. We don't know whether it will be an attack on Israeli territory, which would be very unwise, or whether it might be an attack on the United States facilities somewhere in the region, which would also uh, be unwise. Mm -hmm. People are talking about potentially a strike on Israeli facilities in the occupied Golan Heights, and that is certainly a possibility. Uh, President Biden is undertaking, as you say, a, a strong message to Iran in, in an attempt to damp down what has now become the closest cliff edge towards a regional war, which we have been approaching over the last six months, and maybe we're now looking over the edge at it. And, and your thoughts on the motivation behind Israel launching that attack in, in, in Damascus, if indeed it was Israel that was responsible, as is suggested by almost all sources, what would have been the purpose of this? What would Israel have anticipated the reaction being? Or the response There's being? been a low level of military hostilities uh, against Iran from Israel as Iran seeks to arm forces that are allied with it, both in Yemen and the Houthis have sought to attack uh, Israeli targets, for example, the port of Eilat, and above all in Syria, which is the route to the arming and support of Hezbollah in South Lebanon, where there are also other groups that are allied with Iran's uh, resistance front. And attacks by both the resistance front and by Israel have taken place over over years now, this very significant escalation by Israel uh, in an unlawful attack on diplomatic premises uh, in Damascus has uh, raised the stakes. Um, I suspect that they saw what they would regard as an important target of opportunity when these commanders were gathering uh, at that place at that time, uh, and they thought that it would be a good idea to assassinate them. Of course, assassination and taking out senior military leaders um, is a very uh, poor uh, strategic or tactical move against uh, an armed force which you regard to be hostile because mm. armed forces have leadership in depth. If you think about the potential loss of a bunch of, uh, of American or, or British generals, would that impact seriously on the military power of the British or United States armies? No, it wouldn't. 
And the same is true for the IRGC. So, so, so then why would Israel consider it wise? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, not, uh, the Israeli uh, armed force is not, not deficient in terms of IQ or military history or knowledge of strategy. Why would they do something that could precipitate such appalling uh, retribution? And also that, as you say, doesn't work anyway, because as you describe it, there's in-depth uh, um, uh, army command. So you take out a general, there's another general that steps in. It doesn't do any good. So well, Why would they fail is, to appreciate that? This is the Middle East, isn't it? Uh, no bad deed goes unanswered uh, uh -huh. from any side. And uh, if you were to look at what's going on in the Middle East over decades from outside as a, as, a, as a man from Mars, you would think that humankind had lost its wits with the way in which they use military force, the way in which they are trigger happy, uh, even though, as uh, pointed out by a very senior United States Democrat senator, uh, Mr. Cain, I believe, uh, that much of what Israel's done over the last few months has indeed not contributed to its security, but rendered it more insecure. And, and when you say, you know, were uh, Iran to uh, retaliate and attack an Israeli city, you're, and I quote, it would be unwise, were Iran instead to attack an American facility elsewhere, it would be unwise. Unwise for whom and why? Unwise for Iran, because although they have significant, what they call asymmetric military capabilities, they can't mobilize an air force or a bomber force, for example, but they do have uh, missiles and they do have commando type operations, which they can exert very considerably. Uh, but in a conventional war with Israel, which would naturally draw in the United States, Iran would be the big loser. So that is why it's always been regarded by Iranian policymakers as necessary to take armed action when attacked, mm. uh, but to render their retaliation uh, below the level at which they calculate that a massive retaliatory attack on their own homeland would take place. It remains to be seen whether after a retaliation this time, that uh, strategy of theirs remains intact. Let me, let me bring in Professor Scott Lucas. Uh, Scott, um, is it possible that by sheer force of rhetoric, President Biden can do something to avert there being a really hideous um, retaliation for what happened in Damascus? Well, certainly this is, I think, the American approach, uh, and indeed the approach of other countries, including the UK. And that is that what you do is you raise the prospect of Iranian retaliation to try to preempt or deter it in the US case by making very clear, as Biden put, we are an ironclad commitment to defending Israel despite limited criticism of Israelis' open-ended war in Gaza. And I think the Iranians kind of fed into that because a few days ago, uh, the Iranians, rather by a mistake or deliberate lie, put out the story that they had a message from the Americans that the Americans had told them, all right, don't attack US personnel in Syria or in Iraq but you have a free hand, whatever you need to do with the Israelis. Now, Washington immediately pushed back on them. They immediately called this out, said, look, that's not true. And of course, what they then did is, is to reiterate, if you do come after Israel, we will come back after you. I don't necessarily think an Iranian attack is imminent right now. Uh, I think Iran may carry out a limited operation. So Richard mentioned, for example, hitting an Israeli position in the occupied Golan Heights in Syria. I think they may do that as a demonstration attack. I think Iran's play right now, despite its rhetoric, is actually to go political and diplomatic by saying, look, we're the victim here, just as the Gazan people are the victims, you need to side with us. And it's notable that when the Supreme Leader spoke yesterday, he did say Israel must, should pay a price for what it has done with the killing of Iranian commanders. But he then asked Muslim countries to break economic and political links with Israel. In other words, Iran's play here is a direct military attack. They probably lose that confrontation. If they politically and diplomatically can isolate Israel and sort of drive a wedge between Israel and other countries, then they get a win out of this.
Did you agree with Sir Richard Dalton's analysis that Israel probably has done nothing substantial so far to safeguard its own security? Do you think that what's been going on in Gaza has failed from an Israeli perspective? Well, I, I, Sir Richard's far wiser than me. And, and I think we would all agree that what Israel has done in Gaza has actually been catastrophic uh, for Israel on a number of levels, militarily, politically, and morally. But I do have to sort of have a different view in terms of what it's done in Syria regarding the Iranians that it's hit. Because as Sir Richard pointed out, it, you know, Iran, Israel has been attacking Iranian positions in Syria for more than a decade. The difference is they shifted at the end of last year from going after weapons and munition being sent to Hezbollah, an ally of Iran, to actually <coughs> targeted assassinations. So they've actually killed a series of Iranian commanders since last December. This attack in, on the embassy grounds was not the first. Iran's top commander in Syria was killed on Christmas Day, for example. And the Israelis are doing that because Iran has not been able to respond to those targeted assassinations. And while the point is there that militaries do have strength and depth, I think there's a similar case which says the exception may raise an issue over the rule. And that is when the United States, whether rightly or wrongly, assassinated General Soleimani, who was perhaps one of the top Iranian commanders in January 2020, Iran has found it difficult to replace a commander like Soleimani. And I think Israel's thinking, look, we just killed on April 1st Iran's top person for Syria and Lebanon. Let's see them replace him as well. I'm not justifying what the Israelis are doing, but from their point of view, if the attacks are taking out Isra uh, top commanders without any cost being paid directly by Israel at this point, you keep doing it. Uh, and, and so, Richard, can I ask you about what you think might happen next? Obviously, I realise you have no crystal ball. I'm well aware of that. But, you know, this 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 conflict has been so distressing from whichever perspective you observe it really to people all over the world. How do you see it ever coming to any kind of conclusion or what do you see happening next? I'm pessimistic. I think in the short term there may well be a ceasefire agreement to cover uh, a release of hostages and a release of Palestinian prisoners held by Israel. Uh, but that looks as though it's unlikely to be linked to a permanent ceasefire. Uh, British policy, American policy appears to be to try and work from a limited ceasefire to a permanent one, uh, and thus to avoid uh, the uh, imminent invasion of Rafah, 1.5 million Palestinians in an area, I was told, the size of Heathrow Airport uh, with nowhere to go. Uh, that would be a humanitarian disaster, and Israel appears to be determined not to listen to advice that it should forbear and settle for what they have achieved already, which is a massive degradation of Hamas's military and political power. So uh, it's 50-50 whether there might be some cessation that lasts or whether we'll see a continued war for months to come. And, and, and Professor Scott Lucas, your, your view of what might be imminent or what might eventually bring this to a conclusion? I don't think we have a conclusion, Vanessa, which is coming up, because I'll just say one thing for your viewers to think about. Whatever you think about what has happened in the Middle East, and specifically Israel and Palestine in recent months, as long as there are Israeli troops inside Gaza, whether or not they're actually attacking a city like Rafah, whether or not they're continuing to add to the death toll of more than 33,000 Gazans, as long as there are Israeli troops who are occupying part of Gaza, you will not have peace, you will not have stability, and you will not have security for Gazans. But you could say it the other way around, couldn't you say, as long as, as, long as, as long as Hamas continues to hold Israelis hostage, you might say you can't have peace. You might say it's the other way around, mightn't you? I, I, I think you're absolutely right that Hamas carries, in fact, responsibility for this, for what it did on October 7th with the mass killings. But the issue right here is, is that since October 7th, the mass killings have been inside Gaza. And again, while Hamas is inside Gaza, but at the same time, while there are Israeli troops inside Gaza, you won't have security not only for Gazans or Palestinians, you won't have security for Israelis as well. 
Thank you both very much indeed.